We like to answer your questions. And so without further ado, Frankie. It's time for a little yes, fashion Yes, moderator Q&A, Lewis tells MMA me there's fans. a lot of good questions. I have not Ladies and gentlemen, them, the moment has arrived to hear from the man himself, but Ariel I look forward. Hawani. Live from the Fox Studios in beautiful New York City, it's on the nose. And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet. Yes, out of your seats, on your feet. Ariel Helwani. By the way, quick aside, thank you very much for that, Mike Heck. Uh, Anyone going to be at uh, UFC 282 next week in Las Vegas? There's a chance your boy will be in town. Not to attend the event, but maybe do some other stuff beforehand. So be on the lookout on the socials. We might be in town, you know? We might make our presence felt in Sin City. You guys going over there? Anyone going? Anyone have plans to be in Vegas for the big Uncle of title fight? No. Alex? Andy? Joe? No? No one? All right. Uh, well, someone was going to say something. They're getting gunshot. <laughs> A couple of them looked like they were about to. Yeah, someone was going to jump in. They all had their hands on the... <sighs> wow. All right. Well, we're back to question one, uh, being the first person to actually ask a question whenever I dropped this yesterday. It's Muscamente MMA. Hola, Ariel. My question today is regarding ex-fighters becoming commentators. Do you think it is appropriate for the UFC to have Paul Felder, Charles's last loss, commentating on possibly the biggest fight of his career? Yeah, sure. No problem. I mean... Yeah, what's the issue? Uh, I know there's no beef between the two. Felder's an extremely talented commentator who puts all bias aside, but surely just seeing him could be off-putting for Charles. What will happen when John Jones comes back? Will DC commentate? Many thanks for um, from all the Hillwani hitmen, the Hillwani hitmen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have no issues with that. I mean, if a fighter has an issue, then that would be a personal thing. Uh, DC has abstained from calling Jones fights, so we'll see what happens. Maybe enough time has passed. I don't think the issue or the question is, should a previous opponent be in there? Because let's be honest, there's no bad blood. Um, It was a clean fight, lost fair and square, all that. It's teammates or someone that may have a beef with either you or your team. For example, some people may not like if, I don't know, um... I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of someone who may have a conflict. Like if DC was calling Habib versus Connor, then you could say, all right, you know, he's boys with Habib. Maybe he's not going to. And I've never seen this, by the way. There's this oh, there's always this narrative online, especially on Twitter during fights, like this guy's biased, this guy's biased. I've never really seen it. Sure, the commentary may be, you know, weighted towards one story or another, one fighter or another, but I've never seen DC or Cruz or Bisping or Felder. Open. There was a fight. Um, in Abu Dhabi, and it was Felder calling Brady versus Bilal, and he had a relationship with both guys. Now, I know that's not exactly what you're saying here, because here you're saying if he has a relationship with one, good or bad, over the other, but I don't really think it's a big deal. The only time where I think it could be an issue is, A, if it's something super, super, super personal like DC Jones, or B, if it's a teammate situation. And by the way, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if they say, all right, we've got a card filled with 13 fights, and for this one, DC's sitting it out. Or this one, Cruz is sitting it out. What's the big deal about that either? So it's fluid, it's flexible. But for your specific question here, Felder calling a Charles fight, if it doesn't bother Charles, you know, that was so long ago, and I don't, I don't see why. And anything, like, Felder's going to big up Charles. As long as Charles does well, it makes... Felder look even better because he beat him. Last guy to beat him prior to the fight. So don't think it's a huge, huge deal. Unless a fighter brings it up or the promotion thinks it's a big deal. And then if that's the case, uh, just have the guy sit out. You know, there was talk in the past about Rogan and guys who trained with Eddie Bravo. And yeah, sure, maybe it was, but like ultimately, who gives a fuck? Just watch the fight. You know what? Just mute that fight if you think that there's a bias. Or, or how about this, guys? How about this? If it's a pay-per-view, watch the MMA fighting watch party stream. How about that? Well, what a plug. Of course, we all remember when I plugged in and then tuned in and you guys were talking shit, but that's just the kind of guy that I am. Team player. Hashtag. You guys doing it for uh, 282? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, Andrew, what's up, Ariel? Earlier you mentioned Francis is about to be a free agent. Yes, uh, mid-December. His contract's up. 
Are they that far apart or is there just no talks at all? P.S. Can we expect to see GC at Bellator on December 9th? How about that? Answer that one first. You going December 9th? Oh, man. Rick's trying to get me to go. I have, wow. a, I have a conflicting event. What is it? A pretty ritzy, uh, you know, high, high-end birthday party I've been invited to. Ritzy high-end birthday party? It's for the president. Who, who do you know that's having a ritzy high-end birthday party? Yeah, uh, it's just one of my friends. I'm not really sure why the birthday party is. Uh, they're just going all out. They're going all out for what? 29, 30? I actually don't even know how old they're turning. They rent it's not it even like a milestone birthday? They rented out an entire club. <laughs> Uh, you have to RSVP. RSVP. But is it a big one? Coming up. You're 29, right? Yeah. So I would I would assume like your friends are around your age? Yeah, this person is younger for sure. So ah. probably like 27. So it's not even like a big, it's not a 25 or a 30 or a 35. It's like not it's one a, of those. It's a joint birthday party. Uh, themed. Joint? Aspen themed, I believe. Like a skiing theme? Yeah, I think so. My roommate's pressuring me. My girlfriend's pressuring this me. Is, this is the night of Bellator, Sabatello's yeah, thoughts? Yeah, Biggest yeah. night of Bellator history? Yep, yep, yep. And then Rick's pressuring me on the other end. I'm getting pulled every which way here. I don't know what to do. Which is weird because I feel like in the past it would be you trying to get Rick to go to a Bellator. Yeah, like, yeah, I know, I know. Rick's the Rick, biggest Bellator taste- hater in the biz. Are we taking the Tesla up there or what? Oh, Rick's here. By the way, I, I'm here. <laughs> oh, and none, yeah. none of this is is true what? even like remotely what do you I mean said one i haven't said one word about trying to get him to go to bellator wow what? Oh. bellator 288 December 9th isn't it Se- is it 289 i think it's 289 yeah. <laughs> who knows i think on the show on monday you were like yeah i'm going uh also untrue said would like to try we'll see oh, you'd wow. like to wow. wow no i if i'm you know being honest i thought you were like pretty Set on going. Me too. Yeah, this is a pretty. I even got that impression, Rick. Yeah, yeah. This isn't really much, Rick. I'm about to just RSVP to the birthday. Yeah, at this point. So I guess you're not going. Be be my guest, as as mentioned uh, moments ago. I think Rick Rick was was actually looking for a way out. He probably told you know the powers that be at Bellator he was going to try and go, and now he's looking for a way out. No, I must I, admit, this is one of the weirdest scenarios I've ever heard. Play out this is so weird. because I've been attributed with trying to get somebody to go to something, and now I'm just like, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't. Please, go do your other plans. Wow. Don't care. Wow. I thought you already booked a couple nights for us at the Mohegan. Like, I thought we were going to make a whole weekend of this thing. No, you. Whoever, whoever has been texting you with my name wasn't me. Maybe it was please, Frank. By all means. Enjoy I the this slopes. This was a hard push. Go, go to this is even lower than me, to be honest. By Rick, wow, we're not going up to CT. That we we're going to hop in the Tesla and t- yeah. Oh well, I there. mean, if if you're trying to if you're trying to get it to happen, let's do it. See, see, now, now you're committed, right? Now I show some willingness, and you know, Rick <laughs> is all over it. Is Frank in? No, but no if it's flaking that you True. call an hour before going yeah, somewhere, yeah. what do you call it when you've invited this, someone somewhere? I really do recall them. saying to uh, well, Eric. You're going to this is, this Bellator, is you're going to UFC. Behavior. What? Is this, this a misunderstanding? Behavior. How is, could three people misunderstand? Here? Yeah, I don't know. Wow. So wait. There has been zero. Uh, let, let me be very clear. There has been zero conversation about this. I someone actually thought it was completely someone, fabricated. Someone pulled the tape yeah, from Monday. He pulled definitely tape. mentioned it on Monday. And I thought it was really and nice. I mentioned the event. I said no. I said nothing about, hey, are we it's going? a lot of subtext Connor, to you said you, you said you'd like to zero. go. Okay, so... We have Frankie Flakes and, and overreaction right mm-hmm. here. I mean, yeah, I like the. By the way, this I'm a is, big fan of the nicknames. Yes. No, I have, I have nothing else to say on this. Wow, I'm, I'm being okay. I'm be. This is this is. But by the slam. way, I don't think there's anything bad. Are you going to Bellator on December 9th? As I said last week, I will reiterate. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to go. Seems pretty cool. Might try to go. <laughs> but somehow that turned plans with connor that have never I'm, been discussed i thought we had the tesla charged up i thought we were making our way up 84 to, to no, no. Being as, as like making plans with people has there has been no discussion wow oh, do we want to make the plans right now uh, it feels know. very flaky connor, right it's up it's up to you you okay. uh are you in if connor's in my plans have nothing to do with connor i don't know how much <laughs> wow more so you would go this. to bellator who are you going with and it, so if I was going to Bellator and I'm you were not, going also, you would just make this sort of I'm not committed you know. to going anywhere. Where is this coming from? What is, what is this what is this thing that is being done here? What are we my, done here? My, what are we done here? My my plans have nothing to do with Connor. Wow, I can't at all. <laughs> I'm this birthday offended. party is is something I've never heard of before. That is um, new. Because, that is new. Yeah. Yeah, that's a new ring. Because as everyone. 
as I'm saying, there was no conversation about any other plans. So why would the birthday party come up? Because we weren't talking about going to anywhere else. And now, uh, uh, this was sort of an internal dilemma. It, yeah, it's up to it's up to Connor now. All um, right. Well, I think what we've determined here is you're very much on the fence about going, which is fine. I'm a definite yeah. maybe. And I feel like GC's not going. You have a great birthday party that you've been invited to. Why the hell would you go to that? When you, I mean, you did say your last experience at a Bellator event was pretty miserable. I wouldn't go as far to say miserable. You said you had a light, light shining on your almost. face the entire time. The light was tough, and it's in the same arena. Same so arena. Where it's going to be. The merch probably sucks. Probably just going to be like a logo good. with like 282 or whatever it is. What is it? 282? No, it's 289, 288. Yeah, yeah anyway. officially passed UFC. Um, well, sort of. UFC has all those other events, but I get your point. Uh, to answer the first question, who would have thought we would have spent more time on the second part of this question than the first? Uh, Francis is about to become a free agent, but I'm hearing that talks are actually pretty good. And, you know, you saw Eric Nixick, his coach, reference March 4th. I've been saying this. Since, how long have I been saying if they couldn't get a fight in December for Jones, the March early pay-per-view was when they were going to try to do Jones versus... I, I think I may have said it like... 10 times. So none of this is new. The newish stuff is that he's no longer Francis represented by CAA. That opens the door to Endeavor wanting to do business. They will do business. And as I've said, I think they figure it out and I think he signs and I think they try to make that fight March 4th. So the the deadline means nothing anymore, right? The deadline means nothing. December 10th, he's not fighting. Jones isn't fighting. They're not fighting in Rio. They're not fighting in Perth. The next available pay-per-view is March. That timeline works out, certainly for Jones, but maybe even for Francis coming up the knee, um, you know, surgery from many months ago. Uh, I feel right now very confident that he's going to resign. Plus, there's no Fury fight out there unless Fury gets on the mic on Saturday after beating Chisora for the third time, which we all expect is going to happen. It says, Francis, where are you at? It doesn't seem like Fury's into that anymore. Right, He has this change of heart. He wants to fight. He wants big fights. He wants to keep going. I would be shocked. Where's Francis going? Where's he going? Doesn't have the leverage that maybe we thought he did. And more importantly, doesn't have the roadblocks. Now, a lot of managers, and in particular one, and you all know who I'm talking about, have tried to kind of like broker a deal. Francis standing pat, like he is not doing deals with any house managers. He's not doing any sort of friendly deals. Like he is sticking to his guns and I have an infinite amount of respect for him in that regard. And in all regards, to be honest, but when it comes to this business, like he is not one of those guys who says something on, you know, the zoom and then does something behind the scenes. So I think he'll get what he wants to a degree. Obviously he has leverage now as, as the UFC champion and there's, that's a big fight. That would be one of the biggest fights of 2023. So I, I feel pretty confident as of right this moment, this could change tomorrow that they'll figure it out. Um, handsome Rob, hola, senor Helwani. I'm in awe with how Kayla handled the loss. If you were managing Kayla, what would be next? What would be the next move for her? Well, what I would do is I would, uh, Anytime she fights, I would walk to the neutral corner and shout out instructions in the middle of the fight. Would a one-off rematch be out of the question since Kayla is not entering next season's tournament? Does this loss make her any less appealing to other companies as Kayla enters free agency next year? All the best to you and the boys in the back. Don't forget, she still has two more fights. She wins those two fights convincingly. You know, I would, uh, I would not worry about her free agent status. I don't see any momentum for the Cyborg fight. To me, there's one fight that I would work on and I would try to make it for like that first event, right? So maybe you delay the start. So they're not going to do 55 next year. They're going to do 45. And Pacheco should probably be a part of 45, you would think. She has fought beneath 55, and Kayla's only done it once. But Kayla's not going to be a part of the tournament because she has only two fights left. I would try to do that, try to build off of it. Your first event is probably going to be around April or so. Non-challengers, I mean like the official events. I would do it for that first show build off the momentum. It's four months away, plenty of time, and then see where she goes from there where, you know, for the last fight. That's the fight to make. There's no other fight at 50, excuse me, at 45, unless it's an Aspen Lab, but uh, I mean, am I crazy? I'd, I'd rather see Pacheco Harrison. Now there's a story than Lad versus Harrison. So I would just do that and then see how it ends up and then decide what you're going to do for the last fight. But this is just one loss. You know, she gets... The win, she's now, you know, three wins, one loss to Pacheco. 
Pacheco. Um, this doesn't really hurt our free agency. It's not, it's not the, the disaster that everyone wants to make it out to be. But, you know, if she stumbles in the next one, then it's a pretty big hit to her, you know, her brand and her leverage and all that stuff. Newman. Hello, Ariel. Hello, Newman. I really enjoyed the PFL Championship event last weekend, and it seems like they are continuing to build momentum as the number two MMA organization in the world. The PFL is clearly the most progressive MMA organization when it comes to trying new things, such as the league format, live stats, the ref cam, etc. 100%. Now, I don't know who's making the most money or who's making the second most money. The gap between the UFC and the rest is, I mean, insane. It's it's like it's like the size of Russia, you know, compared to Australia. But um, as far as traction, buzz, who people are talking about, who people are looking at, yeah, they're number two right now. On Monday's show, you and the guys discussed other new wrinkles that they could add for next season, but nobody mentioned open scoring. Wouldn't the PFL be the perfect organization to implement open scoring? Mm, sure, but that's not a PFL decision. That's an athletic commission decision. So you can't go to New York or Georgia or Texas and say, we want open scoring. That's a commission thing. So you'd have to go to a place like Kansas, like Colorado, which do it. Would it be a nice thing? Sure. Do they need it? Not really. But ultimately that type of stuff is a commission thing, not an organization thing. Connor from Canada. Hello, Ariel. As a fellow Canadian, I was wondering how you are handling their early bow out in the World Cup. Like you, I take sports a bit too seriously. That is true. And have not forgotten or have not gotten over their loss to Croatia. How do I move on with my life? Also, could you describe what it was like seeing Canada score their first goal in World Cup history? Thank you for all that you do. Uh, Lewis adds there were some other uh, feelings. In... Oh. Um, <clears throat> you trailed off there. Yeah, I was just reading his... Uh, he he gives me footnotes. Uh, he likes to add... This is not a question. It's just sort of pertaining to Connor's question, which I'll get to in a moment. But Caleb writes, Hi, Ariel. No question here. Just want to say that Connor, and that's GC, not the Connor who just asked the question, is a traitor. And then Maverick says, Hello, Ariel and team. GC, what a great rib on Ariel last week with the Belgium jersey. His reaction was priceless. How, how do you feel about the traitor comment, GC? Mm. Harsh? No. No. Means Accurate. Do you feel? No. That's her opinion. That's fine. No remorse. No, absolutely none. Wow. I know. I think you were expecting an apology maybe yeah. on Monday. No, no. Nothing? No, no. Not even after my donation and all the great things I've done? Well, that was now, you know. I obviously, you know, thanked you well, just, on, on the side, gave you a, a nice tweet right. to prop you up, Instagram story, but told you you didn't have to do it. You did it anyway. My country. Kindness of your heart. Jersey, big game. Ima okay. Imagine I would, we were doing a show yesterday and I showed up in an Iran jersey. Yeah. How would you feel? Uh, it just would have equipped me with more trash to talk after the USA. You wouldn't have felt a certain way, like, wow, that's kind of shitty. I would, have, I would have found it to be a little odd, yeah. What? So there, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> if you own, no ties. Like, if, if you would have showed, if we were playing Denmark and you showed up with the Ericsson jersey. Yeah, yeah, By the way, yeah, how did yeah. Denmark do today? Ah, uh, unfortunate. Uh, I did hedge on Australia, though, so it's all right. I was I was happy for the Socceroos. You know what I mean? Like, the, I would have been like, I right, mean, fine. my first question would be, why do you have an Iran jersey? Yeah, sort of like, why do you have a Belgium jersey? I, I had an explanation. <laughs> it was a I very... A, it was, I took a future on them for Europe uh, 2020. Oh my God. And by the way, it's Iran, not Iran. I think I just did say Iran. No, I know. I was doing the thing from the press conference. Yeah. Did you see that I think clip? you said Iran, yeah. Yeah, well, Tyler just, Adams. Yeah. What a, well, oh my God. I probably have watched that clip 20 times. I'm so impressed with that young man. 23 years of age to handle a situation like that with such class and maturity and dignity... I wouldn't have reacted like that, and I'm 29. I well, first of all, like the, the first like comment degree. saying, like, let's get something straight. It's Iran, not Iran. Like, yo, bro, chill. Now, we know all these guys are coming from, you know, state-run media, and they're just there to try to embarrass the Americans and all that stuff, but geez louise. The question, did you see that press conference? The questions that Adams and the coach were being asked were absurd. Someone needs to be there and be like, yo, this stuff isn't going to fly. But Adams was so, oh my God, he was so impressive. And it's a shitty situation because, you know, I know some of the people in Iran have, have spoken up about the regime there. You just hope that they're okay going back home. 
I mean, brings out a lot of emotion. I will say this. I'm going to get back to the Canada thing. Was yes, I was thinking about this. Considering all the weird feelings towards America and the flag and politics over the last, I don't know, dating back to 2016 or so, was that like the most unifying and proud moment for America of the last six years? I don't recall the last time I saw so much like positivity and also unity regarding the flag and the country. No, oh, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. It's like the memes that like, you know, everyone always talks crap about the country. And then when the Olympics and the World Cup roll around, everyone's got their stars and stripes on. Sure. But even Olympics, because last Olympics were during COVID, very divisive. Yeah. Like, I, I just feel like yesterday and I didn't like do Didn't a make complete... it in 2018 either. No, exactly. That's what that's what I'm saying. So I love it. I like to see everyone. It was it was it. nice. Yeah. It was nice to see people celebrating America, celebrating the flag, and like no division, no politics, no bad feelings, no none of that. It was really cool. Bunch of kids doing big things overseas. I mean, that's the beauty of of a stage like this. And I don't, I, I really don't think any other sporting event could do this. Um, not even the Olympics. Anyway, going back to the initial question was very, very bummed. I mean, I can't tell you how excited I was to see Canada in the World Cup. I mean, I can't properly... Again, I grew up in a family filled with immigrants. Soccer was number one. You know, my my uncles all played it. You know one of my uncles, Gadsad, he talks about soccer all the time if you follow him on Twitter. Like, it was just a huge, huge, huge part of our household, our, you know, lifestyle. And I wasn't even good, but I would always be forced to watch it. And, you know, admittedly, was number one was was NBA for me as a kid, but it was just always around. I remember Italian 90 very, very, um, very, very well. I went to a 94 game, as I said, Nigeria and Argentina at Foxborough. So it was just a big deal. Played it. And my kids play it, and uh, it's really their favorite sport. So to see Canada right now qualify in a field of 32, not the one in four years where they get in as host and also it's a bloated field, was an immense... Um, achievement and a source of pride. And then to see how they did it, top of the table of CONCACAF, the Davies and David and Herdman and all these guys, like it was great. And, you know, I changed the start time of the show. I wanted to watch it. I watched it with the guys. It was great, except for the whole Jersey fiasco. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because I really thought they should have won that game or at least got the draw, get the point, suck that Davies missed the PK, went home that night, didn't tell my kids that I saw it. They waited, and I had to watch the whole damn thing all over again um, and try to pretend like I was reacting to the Davies Miss PK uh, for the first time, even though it was tough to do, and I don't think I did a great job. And so then we had Croatia, and I was very nervous Sunday morning, super, super nervous. I mean, there were a lot of things going on in the tummy. And I, you know, I've had, obviously, exciting moments as a sports fan. I've never been able to see my team win a championship, but that Davies goal... 90 or so seconds in, I mean, I I think I like jumped so high almost to hit the, the the ceiling. I freaked out. I mean, it was just, it was so amazing to see it all unfold. And then the burst of power and speed and then heading it in was just incredible. And again, it still doesn't really feel like when I look at the logos, it's like, what Canada made? Like we were such an afterthought when it came to soccer. I hadn't qualified in 36 years and just sort of a laughing stock. And you'd see like teams lesser teams always make it in CONCACAF. So very exciting. End of the game. It was deflating. It was a bummer. Didn't really want to watch the Spain-Germany game. But, and I said this on Twitter, but I, I want to take something back now. I said I was bummed about Thursday's game, like was dreading it initially. Now I'm actually really looking forward to it for multiple reasons. And I've rearranged everything and I'll be watching it and cheering like I was on Sunday or last Wednesday. Number one, we're still playing in the freaking World Cup, all right? And it's only the third time I've ever been able to see them in the World Cup, and so that's a big deal in its own right, and I'm going to appreciate and enjoy that. Number two, uh, there's still a lot of boxes to check in their World Cup history. Never got a point. Not even a, no, no draw, no, no three points, no nothing. Let's get a win. Let's get three. If not, let's get one. We got our first goal. Let's get another goal. Let's get two more goals. So there's still a lot of things that you could do to hopefully check off all those. But like, wouldn't it be great? Two goals, a win. Now you could check off all the boxes. Go into 2026, clean slate. We're hosting. The team will be much better. Everyone's so young. Davies, David, Kone, all these dudes are so young. 
let's go. And so I'm very excited about tomorrow. I don't love, like, I would hate for someone to relish the idea of being spoiler, but we can be a spoiler to Morocco. You know, no, no beef there, but uh, that's just the way the, uh, the cookie crumbles. So we can try to spoil their plans. But to me, this isn't about spoiling anything from Morocco. This is about our history, our journey, the country, what it's done for the country. The ratings have been nuts. The viewership has been nuts. One more World Cup game on a big stage. Why the hell not? Get the points, get the goals, and uh, let's go with a, you know, with a fresh slate into 2026. So bummed initially, still proud, still excited, immensely proud. Uh, we'll wear the, you know, the shirt tomorrow. We'll, we'll cheer them on. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's like a top 10 moment. Davy scoring like that, like that is, that is up there for me. Um, very, 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 very proud. I mean, I get chills just thinking about it. It was incredible. James, what is up, Ariel? So what's with this jabron chale doubting you and your boys' love for your country, team, the World Cup, and the sport of soccer? I mean, it's just a typical lazy take, if we're being honest. I, I will tell you right now, as a fan, the only thing that I'm consuming these days is soccer. And it's not even because of the World Cup. Like I've told you, men and blazers. I was on men and blazers yesterday in a very awkward spot, by the way. Start of the second half. Uh, USA run, like I could tell they did not want to talk to me. And I even told them if you want to reschedule, but no, they had me on their Twitch stream. It was great. All I'm consuming these days, as far as like, I go through waves, right? As a viewer, as a listener, podcast consumer right now, it's only soccer pods I'm listening to that. I'm listening to BBC, the athletic, um, some of, uh, Lebitard stuff. Uh, I'm just really into it. And it was, it, it was really the, 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 the turning point for me I will say was when we decided that we're going to be Knott's Forest fans and I went to the game and I got to experience that. That was a lot of fun. So ever since then, like, I'll be honest, obviously, you know, you know, some of it was a gag, but I'm really, truly invested. I really, truly like it. And if you want to roll your eyes, you can, but uh, my kids, that's their favorite sport to play. It's their favorite sport to watch. I'm watching games with them. Like who does, uh, I don't know, uh, Vinicius Jr. play for? And they're telling me, um, not, not their you know, their, their, their country team, their club team. So they're telling me FIFA, we got the cards, they got the, you know, the, the gear, all that stuff. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm enjoying it. Let me live. Let me enjoy. Let me be a fan. It's been a lot of fun. And always during the world cup, I really get into it, but uh, it was even prior to that. It was really going to the, the, the forest man city game that made me feel like, wow, this is fun. This is I mean, incredible. It's exciting. So yes, it's all real. He was wrong. He was he was wrong about everything. He was right about one thing, and I'll tell you what that one thing is when we speak in a bit. Uh, Ahmad, salam alaikum, Mario. Wa alaikum salam. I'm back with another World Cup question. Wow. Now that we've seen at least two matches from each team, answer these questions kindly. Best goal, Davies, for sure. If I'm if I'm going to be uh, unbiased, the uh, Richarlson scissor kick, I believe it was on Friday. That was incredible. Biggest shock would have to be Saudi Arabia over Argentina. Biggest underachievers. I mean, I kind of put Canada up there too. Um, I, I, I really did think Canada would advance. In fact, I bet 50 bucks on it. Um, who am I missing? I mean, if Argentina loses later today, they'd be in that category for sure. Maybe Mexico as well. Overachievers, I mean, Australia, U.S. to a degree, youngest team in the tournament. You'd have to put them in there. Australia, definitely. Most likely to win the tournament right now. I think it's wide open. I think that that's what makes it so much fun. You'd put France in there. You'd put Brazil in there. You'd put Spain in there. You'd put Argentina in there. You know, all the big dogs, for sure. Golden boot winner. <laughs> Lewis writes player to score the most goals i know you know but just in case come on lewis you don't think i know what a golden boot is um maybe mbappe someone from brazil not neymar obviously i was gonna pick my guy uh who was i gonna pick i forget now but i think it's kind of wide open I don't think anyone has more than two. Maybe I'm wrong. Valencia, Ecuador, but he's out. I appreciate your work. P.S. I'll be attending my Saudi Arabia versus Mexico match 
please p- pray for our win. Uh, I guess Ahmad is praying for Saudi Arabia. Good luck. David M., Good day, a couple for you, Ariel, and hopefully Rick is around to give his thoughts on the first one. Is Rick still around? I'm here. Oh, yeah, hey. Wow, the audio sounds fantastic. Um, I watched a video on Anderson Silva where it said he wanted to retire after the Bonner fight, but the UFC kind of reeled him back in. Is this true? If you'd have retired, that would mean the loss and then the positive results wouldn't have happened, and thus the arguments used against him for the GOAT one would be gone. So I guess the question is, is it true I had never heard that, but doesn't mean it's not true. And I'm guessing he wants your take on this, Rick. Uh, yeah, if he retires after the Bonner fight and none of that stuff happens, he's 100% the GOAT, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that is correct. But I think it was just, you know, and you would know better than me. That feels like the Anderson Silva just playing coy, being weird. You know, I want to fight my clone. I'm thinking about walking away. Like just saying weird stuff. I don't think he was ever legitimately no. considering retirement, unless I'm misremembering something. Yeah, he was. He he was but, rolling at that point. But yes, if you stop the man's career right before his, you know, devastating streak of losses, then yeah, obviously that changes his legacy. I like this little camera angle situation we got going on here. I see you right now. This is fun. Um, you see me? Yeah. Oh, nice. Except I'm a little bit too indented, as they say. Yeah. I had not heard that. I don't know what video this is that he's talking about, but... Um, uh, This sounds like Anderson Silva, right? You know, throughout his career, he's always kind of toyed with the media and said stuff, you know, I want to do this, I want to do that, and then never really kind of followed through on stuff. Um, He wanted to fight himself. The clone stuff, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yes, I mean, undoubtedly, like, if he retired there, he would have been 33-4. and and would have had a huge title reign. So yeah, I think it definitely would have helped. Uh, but I think he's, I think he's still firmly in that conversation. Uh, number two, any idea what the pay-per-view buys for 279 Nate versus Tony was, or where to get this number? I'm curious to see if the wild events helped it sell, but can't find these numbers anywhere. No. Have you seen the numbers anywhere? Rick? No, no, no. Nope. They don't make I mean, public. we don't see numbers anymore. Yeah. No, but it's all through ESPN. Yeah, I know. Sometimes people report them. I, I didn't see anyone reporting. So, you know, the, actually, lately you, they've been giving them to like SBJ and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I don't see it lately. I don't see as many yeah. of the reports, and I see more of like the positive PR type yeah. numbers being put out than than the actual reporting. So, um, I don't think we're going to get those numbers anymore. If it's if it's now fully in house for ESPN, what's their incentive to release right. it? Unless, unless there's a huge, huge number, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick, hey, Ariel, we know the title picture for nearly every UFC division, with most being tied up in rematches, champ champ fights are having recently fought, and Ganu's contract situation remains unclear. But otherwise, the only champions who haven't fought recently are Shevchenko and Nunes, who both fought back in the summer. What do you think comes next for both women, and do you think the UFC might actually book their trilogy? Uh, Honestly, not hearing anything, but I've said it. Make the fight. There is no bigger fight for both women right now. Certainly not for Nunes. You could say a Tyler Santos if they're keeping her on the sideline, Shevchenko on the sidelines for Santos, great. Uh, she deserves it. But there is nothing bigger than a third fight. And one might even argue that they missed the boat after, you know, Nunes loses to Peña, even though she avenged it. Make that fight. Make it for Brazil. The Brazil cards needs, I mean, that card needs a bit of a bump, right? With those ticket prices, need a little bit of a bump. By the way, you think the UFC is going to say that 282 is a sellout despite the, I mean, if they say that that card is a sellout, Someone can we find out? Like I, I feel like that one. Are they really going to keep going with the sellout thing? Maybe it did sell out prior, but I would be surprised. I feel like that's a sellout. You think that's a sellout? Two eighty two, coming back to Brazil for that? No, no, no. Two eighty two on Kalayev. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're talking about Vegas. Yeah. yeah, that'll sell out too. That'll sell out too. T-Mobile with a light. Ha- You're come on. I don't believe this. I see the smirk. <laughs> no, way. I don't know. Yeah, the, uh, here's my prediction. They will say it's a sellout, regardless yes. of if okay. it's a sellout or not. All right, that's fair. I'm with you. Uh, give me Shevchenko Nunes. P.S. Frankie Flakes had me rolling on Monday. Sounds even worse than Special K. I accept. How do you feel? Yeah, How do you feel it's, about it's it? Whatever. I'm honored to have that nickname. So unlike GC, who has no remorse for the Jersey fiasco of 2022, do you have remorse for flaking an hour before the... Uh, no, I, I had good reason. And I think Connor understands that. What triggered him is when I argued that that wasn't actually flaking. Mm. Sounds that like he doesn't think it's a good reason. That was definitely triggering. 
the remorse part, he definitely had no remorse. I mean, no, no. I was like, damn, man, you just bailed on me like that? He's just like, yep. And I was like, all right, I would do it again. I if said. you if you knew, <laughs> if you were told that he was alone, would you have still bailed? Or because you knew that he I was mean, with people? He did change the venue. And yeah, this, why'd you change the venue? Yeah, Because they were full capacity. We changed to a venue a block away. Like, he's acting like I changed yeah, it from such a, the Lower East Side. Oh, uh, we're talking side. a block away, Frank? Block Quite away, a block. Dude. You can't talk. Like, I mean, you, you can't even you, use yeah. that. Here's, here's That's here's not the changing the venue. Though, is that the, uh, the second adjustment. venue is not my favorite. In fact, I, I don't like it. Why? I don't know. The service is weird. The, the ambience is weird. I prefer Smithfields. Why, oh. Why'd you change it? Your the capacity. Smith, Smith, Smithfields was literally, you could not get in. There was, and then we tried Jack Dempsey's, could not get in. Love Jack Dempsey's. Yeah, he couldn't get in. Full oh, so capacity. where'd you end up? Uh, Mason Jar, yeah. See, so you could have told me that, I probably would have. I uh, doubt it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will admit, I would have been much more upset had I been on my way by myself. The fact that I had other people, it was okay. Yeah. I mean, you can't really, you, I mean, it's just like, it's an adjustment to the group. If yeah. he was really leaving you hanging, you were going, you know, two guys, and now you're oh, alone. Yeah. That's a, sh I mean, that's oh, almost huge. grounds for yeah. <laughs> maybe we're not friends anymore. Yeah, I was on the subway too. Like I had already left the house. I was halfway there when I got the text. Here's the biggest thing: was he apologetic? Like, was he like, "Yo, man, I'm really sorry," <laughs> no, or was it just like, "Yo, I'm out." No, I don't think there was even a sorry. I think it, I asked him if he was 100% in, and I think the way he bailed, he was like, yeah, I guess I'm not 100% in. Uh, something came up, I'm out. Oh, something came up? He gave you that? The old Jan Brady? Yes. Yeah, there yeah. was no reason. It was Marsha Brady, sorry. There was no reasoning. Who gets the reference, the Marsha Brady reference? Mm. From the Brady Bunch? Something suddenly came up. You guys know that one? Andy for sure knows it. I mean, what was no? what was the Brady Bunch? 1970. Wow, there was a movie. The, the, in the movie, 90s, yeah. yeah. Christine Taylor, I think it was. Anyway, Caleb, hi Ariel. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Yuri vacating the belt due to his injury. On the flip side, Francis has held on to his belt while missing an extended period of time. Do you think one of these approaches is better than the other? On the one hand, Yuri received a lot of positive feedback and respect, while on the other hand, Francis still has the belt. Do you think Yuri's decision to vacate will have a positive impact when he's able to return? I mean, if it's a year, no one's even going to remember it, to be honest. Um, I would have held on to that bitch all day. Why not? Hold on to it. Because that just guarantees that you're fighting for a belt upon returning and they can't screw you, right? Now he's not guaranteed a tell shot. Sorry, Rory. Just hit him with the American flag. Yeah, that was... Was his nose bloody before you knocked him over? No. I would have held on to it. Because uh, all it does is just ensure that you know, you're going to get a title shot upon returning. Uh, Jamal 2020, in light of Yuri giving up the light heavyweight championship due to injury, very strange. I'd love to talk to him about it, but right now he's not talking. Uh, how does fighter health care work? Who's responsible to pay for Yuri's surgery since it was in camp? Would it be different if it happened in the fight? Uh, my understanding is he will be covered. That's my understanding. Now, if he gets hit by a car or something, not preparing for a fight, I think it might be different. Now, Obviously, they would take care of someone who means a lot to them, but if it's pertaining to the fight, my understanding is they cover it. Eliezer Katz, should there be an arbitrary number of losses after which a fighter should be cut, retire, or no longer sanction? I'm thinking Marlon Moraes or Dominic Grace, in my opinion, after getting knocked out cold three times in a row. It's time to call it quits. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's fair. What if we get into decisions, split decisions, controversial fights, all that stuff and more? Mm. Not comfortable with that. It's up to the promotion and more importantly, the fighter and his management. They should know when to say when, but easy for us to say sitting here. Now, what do they do at 35? How do you make money? Where do you go? The, uh, the kilter, my old friend. Uh, hey, Ariel, it's your old pal, the kilter here. Or is it the quilter? I guess it should be the quilter, right? First time, long time. Uh, but felt since we're on the cusp of December, it would be fitting to finally take part in everyone's favorite segment. You've talked a lot about how you prepare for shows, booking guests, etc. But I was wondering what kind of preparations, if any, do the likes of GC, Frank, and Rick make on the days off slash days preceding the show or day of the show? And as a bonus question, what are the scenes like backstage when you lose connection to a guest or can't get hold of them a la Tyson on Monday. Keep up the great work. Stuart. So do you guys know who the quilter is? Should it be the quilter or the kilter? 
Q U I L. Yeah, Quilter. This guy is incredible. He released a song maybe two, three years ago and referenced me in the song. What was the line? It was, uh, the song was called December and it was basically something to the effect of like, I remember it was a huge honor for me. It was something to the effect of like, um, he couldn't fall asleep at night and it was like basically send me to sleep, Ariel. I've been up too long or something. That was the line. Like, and, and how he explained it was that he would listen to me before going to bed. So in the, in the song, it's like, send me to sleep, Ariel, I've been up for too long, something like that, butchering it. But it was, I mean, could you imagine that? The fact that people would do that is nuts. Like just general people. And then someone includes me in a song is nuts. Uh, But anyway, this question, so I hope that uh, Stuart is doing well and I'm forever grateful for that. The question was uh, to GC Frank and Rick. He was wondering what, if anything, do you guys do on the day of days? Prece- he wants to know how the sausage is made. So uh, GC, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm uh, listening to December right now. Is oh, big. did you get to the line? No, I'm looking for it right now. Uh, yeah, prep though. I mean, these picks don't just uh, come out of thin air. You That's don't get true. up, uh, you know, 77 units just by... Uh, Looking at the board as soon as we, uh, you know, go on the air. Uh, yeah, so a lot of research for the picks. Uh, graphics, I mean, all the graphics, everything that goes on the air is is made by me. All the videos and everything like that. So the assets, researching the fighters on Instagram, things like that uh, can be a pretty timely process. Yeah, just any of the production value stuff uh, is it. That's That's my prep, which takes up a decent amount of time. Yeah, that's about that's about it. GC? No, I just went. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I mean, Frank, 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 Frank. Um, honestly, not not anywhere near as much as GC does. Okay. That's it? That's all you That's got? That's all I got. Wow. It's mysterious. I guess Eric's not here, all right? Eric has a full-time job. It's not really... He just kind of pops in on the show, helps out, does the graph, no, does the assets, <laughs> clips, along with Jose Youngs, of course, of uh, the social team, but he does a lot more than just show... I mean, I, th- I think you're selling yourself short, Frank. I mean, you do a lot of prep, do a lot of testing, a lot faxing, of as they being say. Being kicked off the parlay. Oh, yeah, we're, we're getting into all that, too, like day of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't oh, realize yeah. that. Faxing, yeah. rehearsing, rehearsing, liking it up. Wrangling like, the people. Yeah, I have to be the fake Ariel every day. Oh, he doesn't know about fake Ariel. Hmm. I didn't know about fake Ariel. Oh, you don't know about old FA? No. Uh, I literally what is that? like call Probably for a fake area because I don't care who it is. If someone needs to sit in your chair and act like you. Wow, what time does this happen? Uh, before you get here, we get here. Yeah, we get here far before you. Yeah, there's what a t- fake Rick? There's a fake Connor. What time does uh, GC get in? When he rolls in on a day like today, no bets barred. I got here at like eight fifteen, eight twenty. Wow, and you taped it from here? Yeah, from our podcast studio over there. There's no way Jed Mashu is waking up at eight fifteen, eight thirty. I think that's when he wakes up, throws what? out the old Riverside, <laughs> and, and then we do it. And uh, how's the pod going? It's going great, man. Enjoying it. Good vibes? Great vibes. And uh, when it's a Monday, what time do you get in? Usually around like 9, 30, 10. What about you, Frank? Wiggle room. About 10 o'clock. Wow. 10 o'clock? I mean, I get here usually 11, 30. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are eating lunch. Uh, when yeah, when like things go wrong, I think I think he asks when things go wrong behind the scenes. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> with with the, lots of yelling. Is there a lot of yelling? Oh yeah, no. Nah. There's oh, almost no. no yelling. It's just very chaotic, tense moments. Is it? Feels like I yelling. mean, no wonder no one responds to me on Tyson Slack. Tyson Fury. When, yes, we're trying to get him on the air, and if we can't get him on the air, you know, we're gonna have to do All a heavy reroute, this. and yeah. you know, we miss Tyson Fury. We we've always gotten it done. Then we get things like, you know, just the singular question mark from you. Well, yeah. yeah I mean, it says a lot. The question left, mark. A lot left a lot to wonder. Okay. Well, okay. We're breaking the fourth wall here. <laughs> you, 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 you come up with assets. Oh, yeah. and now I see all the stuff I forgot to ask yeah. Chael about the glasses. Yeah. yeah actually, even, as you were getting off the air, I was like, he's not asking about the glasses. I was dying. Yeah. Why wouldn't you remind me? You were a little busy get talking in my, about politics. Get in hey. my ear. You guys were having a political debate. I, I don't even know what we were talking about. I still, I'm, the whole biology thing went over my head. 
I just like seeing the the veins on his neck pop out. Yeah, that was kind of cool. When he lifted up out of the seat. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty crazy. He postured himself to yell. But I you say, I, I say every time, you show me, you okay, here's, we do a little thing. You're the social media guy, so you'll find things on their social media that I can ask for. Oh, I saw on your Instagram, you were climbing yeah. rocks. What do I say after every time? These are great. Can you no. just send me a breakdown? Yeah. Did you send me a breakdown? No, 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 no. I got oh, distracted. Man. So I'm in the middle of a conversation oh, yeah. with uh, OAM, and I'm like, shit, what were the OAM thing? I send a thing, and you are and you write back two minutes later. Two minutes! You know how long that two minute felt? Something happened. Do you, you want to like, know what the two minutes was? Trying to figure out it, was the question polling, mark. it was me polling the whole room, and I was like, why is he sending me a question mark? What and you happened? Did, you didn't, you, it didn't come to... And then know. it clicked. Mm. And then it clicked, and I was. that's why I was like, oh, oh. oh. I forgot to send them. The if you're looking for notes, one sec, my bad. No, no, I was just wondering uh, how lunch was. How was the, the question you know? mark? Like, I don't know if like I don't know if OAM's screen went black. I didn't, I don't know if you couldn't hear him. Like, no, I'm just, question, a question mark can mean many things. I'm locked in, so I'm just dropping know, a question mark here without him thinking like, oh, why is Ariel typing in the middle of my interview? Well, you know, like, so bang, question mark, bang. You no, know, right here, like just just to the left of my camera is a giant monitor that's constantly fixated on you no matter what camera angle there is it would it be so, this one yes very tight shot of you so i can see you i'll i'll get that up close i can see you as you're talking you know you'll you'll do the yeah i'm trying you do the like the like mm -hmm, we can tell you're eye. typing before you yeah. actually type. oh and you know <laughs> something's the, coming the side eye yeah, yeah yeah i'll be like oh he's typing he's typing <laughs> or if i try or if i try and let you know about something and i can see you don't look i'll be like he's not looking he doesn't know but you have a way to communicate in my ear yeah, I know. Just say, hey, Ariel, don't forget to ask him about the glasses. Duh. But then we get confused because then I have to go through this microphone. Oh, right the horror. The oh, horror. Oh, now we're complaining about it. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's exactly why we have this system that you can now say I look like a Now I really look like a producer with this one in front of me. Or a guy who's taking my order from Dunkin' Donuts. Welcome to Dunkin' Donuts. That is rude. No, I mean, that's what the thing looks like. Is that a Floyd Mayweather's is that like a Is that a what? job or is it work? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean... I feel like wow. we dropped the ball with the glasses. Oh, we 100% did. Pictures we, are great. Can we call him? Can, you, can we just put the pictures up? Yeah, I think this would be a nice moment for us to get a, a victory on the way out. <laughs> I, what I wanted to do was ask Chill, what is going on with these glasses here? Let's take All of a sudden he's doing, yeah. I mean, what's happening here? I mean, I feel like this is a victory in its own right. It's him trying to read Twitter. What's happening? <laughs> just how aggressive he looks on the left. What do you think he's saying on the left? Let me you, tell you something about free speech, brother. Do you want to know what it is? Uh, I think it's like a one championship break that. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving his prediction for one championship. Oh, for, my God. Prime. I'd love to know how much you got paid for those videos. Like, uh -oh. There is no way Chael cares about Christian Lee's upcoming title fight. With all due respect to Christian Lee. By the way, he, you ever notice? He did it poolside? He yeah, did poolside? He's on vacation. No and No shot. Has anyone ever said something with respect, but prefaced it with, with all due respect? Usually when you say with all yeah, due respect, disrespect. you're a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. No offense. Yeah. No. Then you're about to say even, something the, that is offense. With all due respect is a thousand percent always somewhat disrespectful. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's why you preface it with it. I actually said it a couple times on Monday. With all due respect to Magomed on Kalayev, they should have went with <laughs> over Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Oh, we really got off the rails there. Yeah. No, it's good stuff. Uh, favorite segment of the week. Two quick questions. Ariel, what transpired after Wednesday's show with the Ali call? GC, how many pictures did you take with fans at the PFL event? P.S. Any merch update? Can we get a womp womp, Frank? <laughs> get, there it is. No update. Yeah. Uh -huh. No update. January 1st, 2025. Out of our hands. That's all I can say. We've done what we can do. It's it's out of our hands. How many pictures? Uh not that many, just a, like just a few. We were we were in kind of like a, a roped off. Aljo? Section. I took a picture with Aljo. He didn't take a picture. I heard with otherwise. Me. No, 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 no. Uh nothing transpired with the Ali call. Honestly. What do you think transpired? I mean, Kayla kind of said that it It was all good in the hood. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Matt Moe. Bonjour, Lord Ariel. What was more annoying on Monday's show? Having lint on your head for two hours or spilling your water bottle all over your pants, Those making it look like you related, had an accident. Also, please allow Frank to participate in today's Parlay Pals. Wow. Too late. Wow. It made me sad when you said you're kicking him out, and I think it's really unfair. Or, Frank deserves better than this. I did retire 
And you guys are holding me accountable for yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, like the whole never... vote thing and the stipulation to come back, that's a little weird. I mean, no, I feel like it's only fair. You it, never would have been out had you not retired. Well, I understand. Like, look, you asked for this, Frank. We're just, yeah, that's fine. We're making sure you're a man of your word because, you know, Frankie Flakes oh, tends wow. to flake on his It's <laughs> Integrity, Frank. Um, definitely. I couldn't care less about the, uh, the length. I mean, did I feel some sort of way that the guys just let me do, you know, two, three hours of programming with it on my head and not tell me? Again, something you could be, hey, um, there's something on your head. you want to just brush it off? Because <laughs> you'd be why like, what's you, on my head? Why? Super loud and freak out. What, do you think I've never used an IFB before? Do you think I've never been I, uh, on I live television? It, you're like, is well, this on air? Is well, it's because it's, it's, it's impossible to know the opposite. So I mean, I like, how am I supposed to know? Well, you didn't have headphones on because of the guest, but the lint Fair. on the back of the head low-key looked like an IFB, so it, bl- right. it blended in. Right. No, 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 the one on the front, the red on the front looked like a cut, but the, the white lint on the side, I was like, it look, just looks like an IFB. And while we're talking about it, if you do have a cut, should we ask you about it or just let it go? Sure, but I don't shave my head with a Bic razor, so I would never have I a cut. I thought it was a rusty knife that you used. No. Yeah. I use one of those things where they go like, the blades. Okay, well. You've been hitting pads lately. I thought it was maybe a little Helwani boxing. Thank Here you got noticing. Thank you for noticing. Look at that shit right there. You see that shit? Oh, it's so strong. Um, Obviously, spilling the water on my pants was way more annoying, but shout out to our good friend Srinivas in the back, maybe listening right now, maybe not, found me a, uh, well, I think it's even still here. Yeah, it's right there. A hair dryer. Oh, and I was able to uh, clean myself up. Why is it still there, Ariel? Because everything stays here. We've got things here from uh, the watch party from like three months ago. We've That's got my... the first thing you see. <laughs> well, it's staring right at me. I'm looking at a bag covered in lemons. Uh, Olajuwon Dream. Afternoon, Ariel. Exciting times as Nathan Diaz is now officially a free agent. Any more word on that situation since you initially reported on Twitter? Nope. Fielding calls, talking to people, but a ways away. Speaking of the Diaz's, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson said to Submission Radio that if he wins against Kevin this weekend, he wants Nick Diaz in 2023. What? What do you think about this potential matchup? Thanks, but no thanks. I don't really have a desire. I mean, far be it for me to tell Nick Diaz what to do in his life. I personally don't have a desire to see him fight ever again, anytime soon. If uh, Wonderboy Thompson beats Kevin Holland, like get a top, I don't know, eight, seven ranked guy, something like that. Wonderboy also said that Jack Black is going to be walking him out this weekend. Incredible. How does that song go again? Um, the Wonder Boy one. Wonder Boy. Mm. Did you did you hear the line from the Quilter? December. I still haven't gotten to it yet. Mm. I got distracted. Oh boy. Um, here's a long one with some uh, annotations. Those are always the best. Yes. Uh, here we go. Uh, Eric Haber, Shalom Ariel. Long but important question. Lately, I've been finding it increasingly difficult to look past the utterly poor behavior of fighters. Strickland's racist slash homophobic comments, nearly all Brazilian fighters supporting Bolsonaro, uh, Mitchell's school shooting denial, Nelk Boy and Andrew Tate involvement, and worst of all, the countless fighters who happily associate with the Chechen dictator Ramzan Kadyrov Usman. Sahudo Gechi just recently. Perhaps more infuriating than these fighters' deplorable behavior is the willingness of virtually all MMA media to completely ignore it and continually prop up, namely, the Dagestani and Chechen fighters. The best example of this being the fighter who called the Chechen teen that beheaded a French teacher a hero of Islam set to compete in just a couple of weeks in the UFC. I've been a diehard for 10 plus years and am on the brink of being lost as an MMA fan. I continually feel so dejected that absolutely no one has the guts to stand up to this nonsense. Do you think it's time to speak up about this pervasive issue and start acknowledging we have a severe deficit in character quality in our sport? Thank you, Eric. Well, I appreciate that. By the way, this is a question that I would have loved to uh, talk to Chael about. Maybe we'll have him on next week. Okay, so there's a lot there. Um, Number one, I would say you just named some people who, as you say, have a severe deficit in character quality. In response to those names, I would offer up a hundred guys and gals who have an incredible amount of character, who are great role models, as he put it, someone that you would want your kids to look up to. 
Uh, do we want to go through the list? Do we want to talk about a Kayla Harrison? Do we want to talk about a Stephen Wonderboy Thompson? Do we want to talk about um, a Daniel Cormier? Do we want to talk about a Stipe Miacic? Do we want, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. There are incredible people in this sport. And, you know, even the lesser known ones to a degree, uh, an Arnold Allen, so to speak, a uh, Alexander Volkanovsky, you know, all these people. I mean, these are true role models. So for every Strickland, I'll give you uh, a Volk. For every Bryce Mitchell, I'll give you, um, you know, a Kayla Harrison and on and on it goes. So, you know, you can pick and choose who you want to watch. That's the beauty of, of MMA. If those guys are fighting, don't buy their pay-per-views. Don't buy their fights. Don't buy their merch. Don't buy anything. Pick and choose. If it's uh, Saturday and uh, Bo Nichols is fighting, you want to support him, great. If it's Saturday and, I don't know, uh, Justin Gaethje's fighting, you don't want to support him, great. So I would just say, in, in no walk of life are there 100% good people or bad people, right? You can pick and choose in the NBA and the NFL. In the NFL, there's some deplorable human beings. And yet there are some great human beings as well. In Major League Baseball, the same. In soccer, the same. On and on it goes. But that's kind of a cop-out answer, right? That's a bit of a cop-out answer on my part, and I recognize that. What you're asking me about, I think, primarily, is the last part of your first paragraph, and that's the Kadyrov stuff. And I will say, number one, I have talked to fighters about going over there. Uh, Chris Weidman comes to mind. Fabrizio Verdum comes to mind in the past. This is not something that is new. And I've talked about his involvement in the sport, and I've talked about some of the, uh, shall we say, conflicts and uncomfortable storylines, to put it very mildly, associated with the sport. I will also say, when I saw the video and the footage and the photos of those three fighters in particular, Kamar Usman, Henry Cejudo, and Justin Gaethje, over there in Chechnya, partaking in these sort of scenes with guns and birthday parties and all this stuff, disappointing. And I'm sorry if that offends someone, but given everything that is going on in the world right now, and given how this country, whom they are proud citizens of, who the likes of Henry Cejudo has represented on the world stage, who the likes of Justin Gaethje walks to his fights holding the flag of, who the likes of Kamaru Usman has said gave him and his family, you know, a better life and opportunity and the American dream and all this stuff. And in this climate to go over there and partake in this stuff, when this country views that individual as a war criminal, as a dictator, what are you thinking? Is, is, is my thought. My initial thought is what are you thinking? Now I've talked to some fighters who've gone in the past who didn't realize at the time Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss, excuse me. Um, it wasn't as widely known, discussed, etc. And I know some of them not want to speak on their behalf, and I know some would love a mulligan. You can't. That's life. You have to lie in your bed. But there are no excuses now. Not with the real sports story, not with all the reporting from the likes of Kareem Zidane and so many others. There are no excuses now. What will you do for a dollar? How far will you go? We know the answer as it pertains to some people. And it's disappointing to say the least. I can guarantee you there are a lot of fighters who would say no to this. I can guarantee you there are a lot of fighters that would say, you can keep your money. I'm not going to do this. But I mean, how many times do we have to talk about all of this? This sport is filled with conflicts. This sport is filled with questionable characters. It's not rainbows and lollipops. It's the fight game. And unfortunately, the fight game can be a very, very dirty controversial, conflicting place. So I do my best on this show to talk about everything. And this is why I love this segment because the stuff that we don't get to gets asked and we're able to talk about it. But I don't blame you if you see that stuff and feel like, what? How, how, Mr. America is over there doing that? Mr. U.S. Olympian is over there doing that? How do we, how do we come to terms with that? Well, I can tell you specifically about them. It's because their manager has a great relationship because he supports a lot of them because he pays for a lot of them to be over there. Um, he funds a lot of their endeavors. And so they're going to go over there and they're going to get paid and they're going to get paid handsomely and it's going to be all good in the hood. And so if that's what they want to do, God bless. You could feel a certain way about that. I don't know what you want necessarily. Like 
I, I love when people say like, who's, I saw someone on Twitter say, Ariel won't talk about this because he's a, this is, this, this is a perfect example of how dumb people are on Twitter and how everyone hides behind their fake profiles and why I am rooting for Elon Musk to burn it to the ground. I saw someone on Twitter a couple days ago say, Ariel doesn't have the balls to talk about this because he's afraid to lose access to Ali's fighters. That's what I saw someone say. Do you realize how dumb you are? And that just goes to show how no one knows what they're talking about. Everyone is dumb. You just talk shit just for the sake of talking shit. And there are new people coming to the sport and there are fake people and trolls and all this stuff. What are you talking about? I haven't had access to his fighters other than the ones that, you know, are able to stick up and be like, wait a second, I'm paying you since 2019. I don't give a fuck. I haven't talked to Henry Cejudo since 2019. I haven't talked to Kamara Usman since I think 2018, Justin Gaethje, 2018. What do I care? So what do you want me to do? What do you want the MMA media to do? And even this, I could guarantee you, even this clip right here, you'll see people be like, look at this spineless coward. What do you want us to do? It's like, only in, only in, for some reason in this sport, it seems like, and the relationship that the fans have with the media at times, and even the fighters and the promoters have with the media, it's like, you want us to cover, every, you want everyone to cover every aspect of the sport. I sit here for around eight or so hours, in addition to the other shows that I do, 10, 12 hours, try to talk about as much as possible. And I also try to read the room, right? I try to talk about the things that you want to talk about that you are interested in. You want me to come here for four hours and talk about that? I mean, I don't know if I'll have, you know, a lot of people watching after minute 15, but I think this is a very important thing. The, the, the part that I'm speaking about right here is that the MMA media needs to stand up and show some guts. I think that over the years, there have been some media guys, some very well- but you know, respected and 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 researched and accomplished people who have shed a light on this story. But it's sort of like the Qatar situation and the World Cup. Do people want the broadcasters mentioning it every single time? They did their due diligence, they did their reporting, they did their mentioning, but at some point, like you're you're kind of like, all right, what are we gonna do? We have to keep on. So we're gonna keep on shining a light on the good. We're gonna keep talking about the good. We're gonna keep talking about, you know, the the positive people and the the role models and the good stories. And we're gonna do our best to stay away from the bad. And one of the greatest things to ever happen to me is, you know, getting banned from talking to those guys. Cause now I have no ties to them whatsoever. I won't get the messages in the middle of the night anymore, the threats and all that stuff. That's one of the best things to ever happen to me. One of the best things to ever happen to me was the 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 relationship with Dana White ending in 2016 because I don't get those messages anymore. I don't get those threats. I don't have that. I feel bad for the people that have to deal with that. So I'm happy I could sit here and talk about whatever I want. And I try my best to talk about as much as I can, but to sit here and focus on the Stricklands and the Mitchells and the Usmans and the Cejudos and the Gaethys for what they do and how they act and what they believe in is not something that I am personally interested in doing because that will drive me insane. I would rather come on this show while at times focusing on this stuff and talk about the Kaylas and the Arnold Allens and the DCs and the Stipes and the Leon Edwards and the Volkanovskis and the Izzy's and the Alex Pereira's. That's what I choose to do. And if you think that that's a cop out or that's me, you know, then that's totally fine. There's enough people out there that are continuously shining a light. I can't do that. That's not the way I want to cover the sport of MMA, but make no mistake about it. It's inc let me be very clear. It's incredibly disappointing. It's disheartening. I wish it wasn't the case. I hope they have a good reason for it. I sure as hell won't be asking them what their reason is. And I hope they're able to look at themselves in the mirror and understand how, how offensive this could be to a lot of people and how it makes them look. Sam, hi Ariel, fighters in one get to put their own ads and designs on their shorts and pre-fight banners, just like old school UFC. Do you think this is because of less cutthroat leadership style from Chatri compared to the UFC, better management for fighters or one simply not getting the massive ad offers yet from Venom Reebok? No, I mean, Bellator is the same. You're allowed to have your own ads and banners and all that stuff. Everyone just has, you know, the UFC cut these these deals because they could and and that's that. But it's not because of cutthroat leadership. They just have that in place. But Bellator, you can have... Uh, you can have as many sponsors as you want. Now, you can have certain sponsors that conflict with their major ones, but for the most part, it's a lot more loosey-goosey than it is uh, in the UFC. Also, Renier de Rivière, 
Did I say that correctly? GC? Grenier? De Ritter? Yep. Uh, successfully defends his light heavyweight belt against the interim heavyweight champion. Can you please ask him to come on the show? The YouTube chat will love you for it. Cheers to you and the crew. Will they really love me for it? They're yeah. big one marks over there, right? Yeah, I'll love you for it too. I actually bet on him. I, I did get a bet on him. You did? Yeah, he's an underdog. Wow. Surprisingly. So I'll be up late watching uh, one on Prime Video 5. All right. Um, hi Ariel Adriano asks Survivor Series recap and thoughts what did you think of the event one of the best pay-per-views in a long time not sure about best but enjoyed war games special uh, the main event was spectacular the storyline with the bloodline and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens is amazing I can't wait to see how it culminates I threw this out on Twitter I think that Sami Zayn should be the one to beat Roman Reigns people keep asking me who should he lose to who should he lose to who should he lose to I would love to see Sami Zayn be the one to beat Roman Reigns and it was right there in front of us but it's because of how they built him up and I think Paul Heyman said it perfectly he said he was a um, he was a, a guest character on a sitcom that has now become a major player on the show and this was supposed to be sort of like a, a, a guest spot and now I mean he's drawing out emotion in the fans and the audience that we haven't felt in a very long time. He's an incredible performer. Reminds me a lot of Robin Williams, not just because he looks like him, but just like he is just prolific when it comes to his on-screen talent. And they're going to Montreal, Elimination Chamber. You can have them finally turn on him then. And by the way, there's a part of me that says, like, let this go for as long as possible. But if it has to culminate, no better place than Montreal. Kevin Owens saves the day. And then together they go after Roman Reigns and he finally gets his moment and he's the one to beat Roman Reigns because there's a lot more momentum on his side than Cody Rhodes or Bray Wyatt or anything like that. I did not think that he was going to turn on the bloodline. That's the second question. And he says, I saw your tweet about Reigns dropping the title to Sammy. I couldn't agree more. Do you think Sammy wins the Rumble? How I envision it. Final four is Sammy, Usos, and KO. Sammy tops all three of them over. Finally, salute to the Canadians of wrestling. For KO and Sammy to be shining, representing is amazing. Yes, and salute to Montreal wrestling in particular. Yeah, it's incredible. And I love the fact that there's a pay-per-view in Montreal, and now Montreal is back on the map, baby. Maybe not so in the world of MMA, although thanks to OAM, we're making a bit of a comeback. But... I love the fact that my city with such a rich history in wrestling is back in the conversation that the venue, that the location, all that stuff is a part of the story. I hope they don't recreate the screw job or anything like that in February, but this is great stuff. Sammy deserves it. He's a lifer. Cool to see KO in the spot as well. We've uh, buried our feud, I think. Maybe he still holds a grudge, but you know, I've moved on. Um, and could you imagine a David versus Goliath match at WrestleMania where it's Sammy defying all the odds, going over on the bloodline, beating Roman Reigns and ending that incredible run, which I think could use a bit of a shakeup, a bit of a fresh coat of paint. And maybe Roman wins it back at some point, but what a, wrestling sells us on moments. Wrestling sells us, and when it's at its best, on unpredictable moments, right? That's what we want. That's initially why... I moved over from wrestling to MMA because there weren't any unpredictable moments anymore. The whole thing was predictable. And if I'm being honest, the Roman Reigns title reigns at times has become very predictable. Oh, there's no way he's going to lose to Logan Paul. Well, why do we love MMA? We love MMA because if MMA was wrestling, Kamar Usman beats Leon Edwards. If MMA was wrestling, there's no chance Larissa Pacheco beats Kayla Harrison, Right? If MMA was wrestling, there's no chance Jan Bachovic beats Izzy. Izzy gets the two belts. But we love MMA because it's unpredictable, because it's not scripted, because we have no idea what's going to happen. It's not some guy deciding in the back. And so could you imagine if there's a scenario where Roman's going up against the blazing hot Sami Zayn and he somehow pulls it off? That's a moment. That's unpredictable. And yes, he is not as strong. And yes, he is not as accomplished. And yes, the great winning streak and the title reign comes to an end at the hands of Sami Zayn, who was a mid-carder for all these years. But that's why we watch. We don't watch because of how it affects the business for the next six months. We watch for the moments, for, for, for how unpredictable it could be, so that we could tell our friends, this guy's going up with this guy. He has a chance tonight. Not, this guy's going up against this guy. But there's no way the booking team is going to let him win. No, that's no fun. No one says that about MMA, and that's why we love MMA, because we think that there is a chance that, you know, Volkanovsky could pull off the upset against Islam Makhachev. Not, there's no way Islam's going to lose the belt in his first title defense. That's how they would say it if it was wrestling. So F it. Go with the hot hand and deal with the repercussions later. 
Sammy's on fire. You've created this incredible moment, this incredible situation, this incredible storyline. Have them turn on him in Montreal and then give us the big fight. Now, if The Rock comes back, that may change everything. But if not, I would love to see it. Fed, just a couple more. Hello, Ariel. Huge respect for the interview with Alex Pereira, or as Chael calls him, Paella. Kudos to you on getting him to smile even though he was star- staring deep into your soul. I was surprised at how calm, confident, and humble Pereira was. You were able to show a different side of the champ. Just wondering if you change your interview approach based on the fighter. It must be challenging to interview a fighter like Pereira. Not really. I mean, what's challenging is the translation, but... Look, when you're interviewing Kayla Harrison after a loss, you're going to have a different tone, approach, style. When you're interviewing OAM next, who just won, it's going to be a little different. And obviously, when it's a translator interview, maybe the questions are shorter, tighter, succinct. But for the most part, it's this. And obviously, if I have a relationship with someone, it's different. So yes, okay. In the end, I will say yes, the style changes depending on the interview. But in his, I didn't feel, I wasn't really intimidated. There was a moment where I was like, I was looking at Plinio. I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. He's, he's translating. And then I just like looked corner of my eyes, sort of like when I try to type something to you guys in the back. I was like, wow, he's staring at me. And then I go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I look, oh yeah, he's still staring at me. And then, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow, he is not breaking eye contact. Pretty incredible. Uh, but I don't think he doesn't like me. In fact, I think that we're, you know, fighting the good fight over here against the, uh, the evil powers that be. By the way, did you guys see that we got a, a shout out on the fighter and the kid yesterday? No yeah, way. It was great. Yeah, it was cool. It was really cool. That was really nice. I feel like we've come a long way in our relationship. Definitely. I feel like we're in a good spot. Uh, also, very curious if Mysterious Frank mic'd up Pereira before the interview. If so, how did this go and did you show him any fear? Um, went really well. It had. Um really good posture. Okay. And then I fist pumped him. Nice. Big which, hands, right? Yeah. Which I thought was, you know, it said enough. P.S. Prayer going after Shab has to be the most random situation ever. Absolutely tremendous. Yeah. I was uh, texting with the guys like, how do we get ourselves involved in this shit storm? What a bizarre one. Who saw that one coming? But kudos to them. I think they said they're going to put the money up. Got a couple of messages afterwards from the, the Hamza team saying, eh, you know, we have a different take on the story. I invited them to come on. Maybe we could talk about that and a whole bunch of other stuff. Thanks to the entire crew for all the amazing content. Keep it up in 2023. Last but not least, and thank you for that, from Taco Enthusiast. Hi, Ariel. In Kayla Harrison's post-fight interview, she stated, I'm not curing cancer. I'm not changing the world. What I do is very selfish. And I do it because I love it. That quote hit me hard. Do you believe that chasing greatness or striving to be the best is always an inherently selfish endeavor? In your journey to be the goat of MMA journalism, did you ever have a particular moment where you questioned your ambition and felt selfish about your career? If so, tell us about that internal battle and how you dealt with it. Wow, what a question to end on. Um, I don't think it is inherently selfish. I think it can be at times selfish, but if your motivation to be the best is to provide a better life for your family, then I don't think it is selfish. But in a, in a vacuum, you skipping someone's party or meetup or lunch date, whatever, because you need to train, that could be viewed as selfish. But if the ultimate goal, the reason why you're doing this, the motivation, the engine, the fuel is to better your family's life, to pay for your mom's house, to get your dad a new car, to help your friend with their bills, that's not selfish at all. In fact, that's the exact opposite. So my motivation obviously has to be... I have multiple motivations. It has always been to be the best that I could be. It has always been to cover the sport the best that I could possibly cover it. It has also been to make the most of my life, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know if this is all going to end. And so while I'm here, I want to try to do as much as possible and be as good as possible and leave whatever kind of impression, the best possible one, as possible. That being said, it has always been the motivation to get as much money as possible and do as many good things as possible to make my family's life as good as possible. And so at times, like I said, you know, with the Kayla training example, there can be a conflict there. When I was younger and I didn't think of this at the time, but I'm happy I did it. 
I used to believe in 80% of success is just showing up. Just show up, say yes to everything, be at every event, go to every show, be gone three weekends out of the month, all that stuff. Now I can't do that because I have kids and I don't want to miss out on the weekends. I don't want to miss out on things. So I have to be a lot more selective with when I go. At times, I have to be a little bit selfish and I have to say yes to things, even though I don't want to say yes to things because I know in the long run, it would be better for me, but also because it's better for me, it's better for them. I don't think I've ever made a decision where it's only good for me and they would not benefit. If I get a good opportunity, I get a better, ultimately that only helps them. And I'm very cognizant of that because I think my parents made every decision to make our lives better, to put us in the best position possible, to give us as much as they could possibly give us. So I don't think, you know, chasing greatness is selfish. I think in a silo, it can be viewed as such from someone on the outside looking in, but I certainly don't think that she is selfish at all. I certainly don't think that she is a selfish person. She brings up her kids all the time. And I think that the reason why, the sole reason why she re-signed with PFL is exhibit A as to why she is unselfish. Because you could say, oh, wait, what do you mean by that? She got more money. No, if she was truly selfish, she would have gone to the UFC and she would have taken less money because she wanted to prove just how great she was, right? We know that that's what drives her. We know that she's the ultimate competitor. She went back to PFL because they were offering her more money, more stability, more security, and all those things benefit her family. She didn't really need more of that. She was doing just fine financially, but it was, you know, to, to better her family. So not a selfish person. In fact, I view her as very unselfish, um, inspiring, to be honest. If you know about her backstory and everything that she has had to overcome, she is anything but selfish. And uh, I'm looking forward to her comeback. I think her comeback is going to be fantastic. I really do. I feel compelled to say one more thing, if I may. Can I say one thing? And I, and I hope that I'm not overstepping any boundaries. You have permission. Truly, I hope I'm not, you know, overstepping any boundaries. This is not a question. But I know it's a personal thing, and I know that there are some people who would say, butt out, and I hope I'm not offending anyone. And I hope that this isn't viewed as me, like, you know, getting my nose into a place where it shouldn't be. But I like, look, there's no, you know, no secret that it has been great covering Conor McGregor's career. He has been quite good to me. He's been quite loyal to me. Obviously, there's been some ups and downs, and we've been able to talk about a lot of them over the years, and uh, he has never told me not to ask about this or that. So, And I appreciate that, and I appreciate what he's done for the sport, and I appreciate what he's done for everyone involved in the sport. I also feel uh, a certain way, a certain positive way, very strongly about Artem Lobov. And so I feel very uncomfortable watching what is going on between them play out in public. And so if I may... And this may not be my place, but I've been sitting here for four hours and it's very warm in here. And this is when, you know, the truth comes out. I would love to say to both Connor and Artem to please figure out a way uh, to end this um, in the most amicable way possible. Because I know that those two had a great friendship and a great relationship. And I mean, Artem was extremely loyal to Connor and Connor, I think, was very loyal back to him. And you saw the emotion when Artem would win and you saw the emotion when Connor would win. And that's not fake. And I don't know what happened behind the scenes. I have no idea. I haven't reached out to either of them. It's very, it seems like it's very personal and very sensitive. And unfortunately, these things happen when money is involved. And I could certainly see someone saying, stay out of it. This is none of your business. And I 100% respect that and to a degree agree with it. But as someone who knows both of them to a degree, I'm not saying we're best friends. I'm not saying we're even friends, period. It kind of makes me set like of all duos, right? Those two had a bond. Those two had something special. This bums me out. And I think I speak for a lot of people when I say that. No one wants to see Connor fight Artem. No one wants to see Artem fight Connor. No one wants to see them even talking shit about each other in public. No one wants to see lawsuits and all this stuff. I sincerely hope that there is a way, even if they don't want to be friends, they could figure this out. They could go their merry way, maybe be friends again someday down the line or not, but no one wants to see what has been playing out over the last couple of days. It really bumps me out. It really does. This is one of the great friendships in the sport. One of the true, at least in my opinion, 
genuine, authentic friendships in the sport. No one wants to see this um, go down the path that it's going down. So that's all. I wanted to get that off my chest. I really don't know what is going on. And, and honestly, it's like it, it's finances, it's deals, it's emails, it's all this stuff. To a degree, maybe, you know, you could say my business is to cover this. Maybe, I don't know. All I'm saying is I'm just a guy here in front of a microphone or in back of a microphone or next to a microphone, which sometimes I like to rub my, you know, chin next to it. Please, on behalf of the MMA community, can we figure this out? Can we be friends again? Please. Thank you. Uh, Frank, did you see that clip when the person was asked, whoa, what was going on and it was me drinking? Yeah, that was... Uh, I didn't realize how annoying it was. It I sounded like a fart. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad that we were able to dispel that. Thank them. you. Yeah. Thank you. Very kind of you. Um, unless you guys have anything else to say, I'm pretty much done here. I mean, you kind of ended it. Do you think that was, you know, like, do you think I said too much? No. That I've ended on the Chechnya question? Cheesy, what do you think? <laughs> oh, that was, yeah. You know what really made me sad when I was like, Frank, can you believe this whole thing with uh, Connor and Artem? And Frank's like, who's Artem? I was like, ah, God damn. Yeah. It's only been a year. I forgot. I mean, you could tell I, me all about... Who's Connor again? Though? Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's true. That's true. You have not... Yeah, Connor last fought. That's amazing. You have not been working on the show during any Connor fight. Oh, let me tell you, it's something. He's not familiar with the man I'm named after. Correct. Yeah. A lot of people actually spell his name like your name. It's a weird yeah. thing. Yeah. 